very good evening and a marvellous welcome to everybody to the virtual National Army Museum. Thank you very much indeed for coming along uh, this evening. And, and, and let me you know, bowl the first ball at Nick and, and ask Nick, why did you choose to write this book? Why do we need a, another book on the Western Front? Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, well, I, you know, I'd written Passchendaele in, and that like, came out in 2017. Um, and I like, I think, like many historians, I'd, I'd written, um, you know, I'd written sort of limited books in a way, books about a limited period of time, or like a campaign or a battle study. Um, and I think for a lot of historians, then they move on to the bigger topics, so they will then write, you know, a wider, bigger history of, you know. <clears throat> of the entire war or, or theatre and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we were going around various ideas about what I could do. I did have some ideas which the publishers weren't that keen on. So, you, you know, this happens to every author. You kind of have your what you'd like to do and what you could do. And, and we had various conversations and to cut a long story short, and then it, essentially one day I woke up and I thought I could do the Western Front. I'll do the Western Front. Um, because there are actually, in terms of books on the Western Front, there's actually not that many, really. I mean, obviously, there's loads of writing about individual battles and, and that kind of thing, which you know very well, Jonathan. But um, actual histories of the Western Front, I actually found, you know, there's a handful. Richard Holmes did one, quite a light book. There's Hunt Tooley did one a few years ago. I think John Terrain did a sort of history of the Western Front. So in terms of single volumes on specifically the Western Front, uh, actually not too many to, to to write home about so you know I wanted to do a sort of big narrative history um, and I wanted to you know when I looked at it I thought that this this sounds this sounds quite right I wanted to do the Americans and the French and then um, pitch it as the publisher and they were really happy so it, it went very smoothly from then so I thought yeah it fits right it's it's a it's a bigger project but it was a project that I was I was kind of ready for and you know I wanted to stretch my wings in that sense and do the whole war on the western front well i think you're right there aren't very many books like this um uh, around at all and, and obviously i suppose one of the reasons for that might be that it let's face it it's a huge topic and 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 you've chosen to try and take it from the british angle the french angle and the german angle uh, all at once it's that that's three pretty big three pretty big mouthfuls i suppose um why did you decide to take that approach and and how difficult did you find to balance those three? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you've got to do all that. You've got to do the German perspective and you've got, you know, you've got to do it. Uh, you've got to have that total picture as best you can, you know, of it. So I, <clears throat> I think one of the things was as well, I wanted to bring the French in because, you know, I'd written about the British and, and that. And I think the more that I learned about the French and certainly in the British world, that the role that the French have played have always been, sort of underrated and not really known about. We might know a little bit about Verdun, say, but but largely the French war effort, the sinews of the French war effort, the effort they made has never really been understood. And so I really wanted to put the, um, I guess, pay tribute to the French army really a little bit in terms of actually putting their story in it. Um, and so, you know, I think that the balance was was trying to make sure that you had a coherent narrative of the entire thing. So you would, you know, you start off in the book and it's it's very much the French and the Germans and that's the war. And the British are very little. But as the book goes on, the British become more and more important and you gradually begin to, to feel the weight of British power. Um, and it's the British and French and, and, and how they, you know, how they fight together or not um, against, you know, the Germans. And then, of course, the Americans come in in the final part of the book. So I wanted to bring the Americans in as well. So you have that full sense of what it was about. Um, and, you know, in terms of writing the narrative, I think it was just trying to, um, you know, I, I kind of, sp I split it up, you know, I'd have a chapter every two or three months generally, but of course you can't do that in 1914 because so much happens in, in, in like four days. So it's really, really tough to do that. Cause if you do, if you do a chapter, so if you, you've got say 24 chapters and you split it between two or three months per chapter, you can get through the whole thing. Um, but of course you can't do it. 19, 1914 is an absolute nightmare to write about because it's so fast moving and fast paced and everything's happening at the same time. Um, but apart from, I think that the, first, the, the opening I found the, the most difficult, I think once you get into 1915 and it, it, trench warfare, things become a little more steady. Uh, I found that much, much sort of easier in a way. 
Um, but I actually found the, the, the most difficult parts I found were, were the parts I'd already written about. So I found the chapter on Passchendaele just hard going because I felt like I was just repeating my, and the chapters at the end as well, 100 days, because I felt I'd already done this. But I need, obviously needed to do it in a slightly different way without without repeating myself or using the same stuff I'd used before. And I found I used a lot of the really good stuff in my previous work. So I didn't really want to copy that. So that I found the most difficult. But in terms of the narrative, it was just really interesting and, and just trying to, you know, so the stuff I found most interesting was that I found the French stuff particularly interesting, that the generals and, and the way they try and break the trench deadlock. I found that sort of that that part of the book really, really fascinating. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's a sort of history I quite like to read. So it was the sort of book I wanted to read really. And I didn't want to uh, overly burden the, the, the reader with too many technical discussions. I wanted to keep it about the individuals and the story. I mean, I, uh, I haven't yet congratulated you. I should, uh, you know, on, on a very impressive achievement. It's a, it's a very good book which zips along, um, I think extremely well. And, and one of the, the main achievements of it, I think is that when you, Generally, when you read particularly one volume histories of, of the First World War, by about 1917, 1918, you can feel the author is starting to flag, you know. Um, yeah. uh, he starts to get a bit tired or a bit or a bit bored of it. And, and and it tends to they always tend to wrap up a little bit quick. Whereas I think, you know, you 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 manage to keep that proportion uh very, very well. But just coming back, I want to come back to, we'll come back to the generals in a moment, but but thinking about 1914 in particular, I mean you obviously made a conscious decision to start when the fighting started rather than to get caught up in discussion of the origins uh, of the first world war. Why was that? Uh, that's a great question. And I, yeah, you're absolutely right. I didn't want to get dragged into the origins because um, I'm not sure necessarily I could add a lot, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not where my focus was. And I think I, I kind of, um, I just wanted to tell the story of the war. And again, I know you, you've got to understand the origins of the war to understand the war, but I just wanted to do that quite quickly and get, get into the war because that's really where the main focus is. And I think in some ways it sort of mirrors, it, it's, it's sort of, it, it has something in common, I think, with Shelby Foote's three volume history of the, the American Civil War, where he doesn't, uh, he just starts from when the state starts seceding and that's it. And he, he you know, he occasionally looks back a little bit, but it, it just starts. You just, you just sat there you know in 1861 and and I suppose it was the same for me I just wanted to sort of get into 1914 and do it so it's because I think if I started to do a significant or at least a part of the book on the origins it would move me it would it would just wouldn't really sit well with the pace of the book and um, because again I wanted that I wanted the flow of time to move nice and smoothly through the book and because I think one of the things I tried to do as well is I go through the winters of it you know what you what I tend to find in a lot of books is they'll they'll finish one year and then all of a sudden it's March and April of the following year so they they just sort of move quite quickly so all of a sudden you're in the Somme and then it's the spring of 17 um, and I move through the winters so I, I have what I like you know I like to have the sort of flow of time so you don't feel you're suddenly jerking forward and it, were I to do the origins it would sort of mess that whole thing up so the origins are very quick and again, I don't pretend to have a lot to say about the origins, really, other than, you know, you just sort of your, do your uh, sort of uh, little brief intro. Um, but I, I would suggest that actually my prologue where I do the origins is is extremely concise. And I pretty much do the origins of the first war in a paragraph. So <laughs> it's very, very broad. So when students always tell me, oh, I, you know, I don't know how to write a lot in a you know, I said, look at that, because I can do the origins of the First World War, which is basically one of the most complex historical topics of all time in the paragraph. So, yeah, I, I just didn't want to do it because I don't think I was that interested in it. And I'm not sure my a lot of my readers would, they just want to find out about the war. And again, um, that won't sit well with everyone, but I'm not sure I care. <laughs> Fair enough. You have to choose your audience, right? Which I suppose brings me on to a, a sort of, you know, softer question, if you like. Was I, to what extent, you know, were you writing this for your students? I should explain to people that, that Nick's day job is teaching staff officers for, from the military at, uh, at the staff college in, in Shrivenham. Is this, 
is this sort of book designed to be a book for them um, in a sense? <clears throat> I think yes and no, really. I think, you know, their, their, their world and what they need to read, I think is quite, quite different. And they don't have the, t I don't think they have the time to go through something like that, to be honest. I mean, I think they need sort of more succinct pieces. I think there's a lot in there for them where they to, to delve into it. I think particularly in terms of command and leadership and technology and, and how you integrate all that kind of stuff. So I think there is a lot in there for them. Um, uh, you know, and I think that, that the book has certainly been influenced quite heavily by the app, you know, the, working alongside the military that I've done for a number of years now. So I think I have learned a lot from that. Just little things, just working with the military, seeing how they operate and that kind of thing. So it's mm. definitely been influenced by it. But I, I mean, in a sense, I just wrote the book I always wanted to read, really. I want a big, chunky narrative history, which I don't think too many people do do as much now. And it's, I, I've come to really, they're the histories that I really want to read again. Maybe I've just, I've just sort of moved out of academic history in a sense that um, it's it's fantastic and it serves its purpose, but the stuff I really, I think, cherish is is the more uh, narrative type histories that I want to read again. So that was the sort of thinking. I just want to write something for people to actually, um, to sort of just give them a sense of what it was like in a way. And I know that sounds very very um, I don't know twee or whatever, but. Um, just to give them an op give them an opportunity to sit beside the generals and just see what it was like and feel what it was like and I've, tr I've tried to do that in the book uh try to get as close as i can to those characters really um but yeah no i think it's uh, i think it's certainly i've been influenced by by you know my experience of working with the military but i i just wrote i, I was fortunate i had a publisher that was quite happy for me to do what i wanted which is which is all you can ask so i just did exactly i did exactly what i wanted to do with the book so, which is you know which does not always happen so um i was no compromises i just exactly i just did exactly what i wanted and what i thought i would like to read really got it thank you let's talk about being a general then so as you said you you you, you very firmly seat the reader as it were in general headquarters or in the army head various army headquarters at various points uh throughout the uh throughout the campaign campaigns um, and, and it struck me that one of the big themes that comes out of this book, and of course it's been one of the most historically controversial uh, aspects of the war as well, has been just how difficult it was uh, to be a general uh, during this war. Yeah, no. I are there general, are there, I was going to say, are, are there sort of, are, are, there, are there general rules about generalship that come out as a result of your study of the Western Front, do you think, first of all? And then maybe we'll go on and talk about some of the individuals. <clears throat> yeah, I th I think so. I mean, I think you can you can trace the, the characters as they go forward and and some of the things that they do and and I think obviously you I mean you've written extensively about command on the Western Front, uh, you know, and your Ruprecht book was very important and influential in my own sort of assessments, I suppose. Um, I think one of the things that I've I've kind of worked on for a number of years. I think there's there's a sense i think it, uh, what i who i think are the better generals are the generals that have more of an open mind in a way that they uh, they 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 kind of they approach the western front from a what do i need to learn what's going on how can i understand this phenomena that's that's so complex and difficult and you get mm. some generals that are far they approach it from far more well this must conform to what i know and what my books have told me and that the the laws of war and therefore we need to do this. And I think you get a, you get a sense, I think, of, of what, I, what I feel the great commanders on the Western Front are those that seem to have a feel for the battle. They have a feel for what can, cannot be achieved on, in any given situation. They might not always get it right, but they have a sense of what they can get, they get away with. And I think some of the lesser commanders are those that, that either lack that, that feel or, or never sort of, um, you know, don't consider it or, or kind of brush it away. And I think, you know, you can talk about Haig or you can talk about Nouvelle or Petain or whoever it might be. But I think my, the best generals are the ones that just seem to have that intuition, if you can call it, about what they can get away with and what they can't. Mm. And therefore they need to think carefully about what they do. And I think some generals just don't have that. So let's talk some specifics. You know, who, who are the generals that you came up, that surprised you either to the upside or the downside, shall we say, uh, in terms of um, handling the challenges posed by the Western Front? 
yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I mean, there's a few favourites of God. I'm a big admirer of uh, Philippe Pétain, the French commander, I mean, national hero. It's, it's probably no surprise, really. But I think he's, he's particularly interesting in, in sort of the 1915-16 period. I think he, he sort of, his career, you know, starts, well, it starts quite late and then it goes, he goes very quickly up to army group level, supreme command, commander in chief. And then he sort of tails off at the end where he sort of loses a bit of his, his sense about what they can do. Uh, but generally, I think he's one of the heroes of the Western Front and, and, you know, clearly saves the French army, I think. And just in terms of how he how he tries to do different attacks and that kind of thing, he was one of the great heroes. I also got a big soft spot for Charles Mangin. Um, you know, whatever you do, you lose a lot of men, you know, his character. Because in, on, on some cases, he seems the archetypal sort of butcher, this very aggressive commander that, um, but I, I got a soft spot for him and he was just one of those, he's like a Rottweiler. You just put him in charge and he will get results. And particularly in 1918, where he just, he's furious and he's that sort of insatiable offensive. Once you put him in the right place, he can do a great deal of, of you know, damage to the enemy. And I think he's one of the great heroes of the war and he keeps at it despite many problems along the way. Um, so he, you know, I think he, he's, I probably wouldn't have liked him as an individual, but I think as a, as a commander, I think he's, you know, he's, he's an extremely hard, you know, he's an extremely hard character. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of admiration for Herbert Plumer and Henry Rawlinson. Uh, you know, that's, that's something I've explored in, in, in previous work. I think they're probably the best British commanders. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we can talk about that, you know, that that's a contro controversial view or whatever, but we can talk about that as, 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 uh, if we want, um, you know, I think I think for the German side, I mean, you you know better than me, but I think for the German side, I think they've got a lot of good sort of operational level commanders, people that you know, like uh, Max von Galwitz and that kind of thing, people that can do good things on the battlefield. It's just the sort of their their supreme command just seems to to really um, really struggle. But I mean, again, lots of other commanders struggle on the Western Front, and it is one of those terribly uh terrible environments we get found out very very quickly what's so difficult about it do you think why is the western front so hard for these generals to manage, manage? or is it hard in fact <laughs> no i mean it is hard it's it's it, it's just the fact that you've got you know you've got an extremely good good opponent you know you've got no move no room to maneuver Certainly in the early days, you don't have a firepower to break down the enemy defences. And, and so, you know, and, and I think that was, for me, I think one of the interesting th debates to have is the sort of the growth of the sort of alternative view where you have a lot of commanders still insist on the breakthrough and then you get a growing cadre that say, no, we can't, we need to fight in a different way, more attritional. And I find that really interesting. Mm. Um, you know, those two poles of thought about manoeuvre and attrition. Um, but I think going back to your question, I think it is a phenomenally different environment because you have this technological revolution going on at the same time as you have this sort of imbalance with technology. So you don't have the communication, you don't have the ability to maneuver. So you have a the war breaks out at a, like the worst possible time, really. If you, your war breaks out 10 years hence or 10 years before, it would be probably very, very different. So it's mm. just that sort of unique environment. But I mean, it's it's horrific and just in terms of the you know the, the losses and you know even on any other front you get the same kind of trench deadlock most of the other fronts you get the same and when you've got a lot of people with a lot of art you know a lot of weaponry you're going to have huge casualties um you know particularly when you are you are up against it in terms of having to attack or attacking when you're not ready you know is it is it is it an intellect uh, is it a matter of intellect, do you think, or a, or a, or a matter of character that distinguishes the good, the really good generals from the from the not so good ones? No, I think it's probably I think it's probably both. I think it's it's a combination of I think character is crucial, an outlook on life, a philosophy, um, but also the ability to be a good manager and deal with multiple things in the air at once and trying to manage everything and uh, work out what you can and can't do and coordinate everything and um, actually think about the nature of the enemy and think about what you're going to do and what you can't do and how you can, um, you know, the need for ruthless, rigorous operational analysis, the need to actually 
take off your rose tinted spectacles and see things how they really are rather than how you want them to be. Mm. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of the, you know, you, you someone like Joffre, um, you know, hero of the Marne was always seen, not particularly intellectual type of chap, uh, never really written anything on war, but had the character to, to win or, you know, not lose in 1914 with the Marne. Mm. Um, you, you get other commanders who are far more sort of literate and, and, and that, that some do well, some, some don't do so well. So I think it's a combination of both really. But I think, you know, cr crucially having the kind of character to ask questions and actually, you know, question tradition, you know, cr question what you've learned and question what you've, the mental baggage that you've got really, uh, that you've brought to the war. Mm -hmm. Well, you won't be surprised to hear that we're getting some questions and you won't be surprised to hear that the first one is about a bloke called Douglas Haig. So why don't we, why don't we attack it head on? Uh, can you think of a better commander of the BEF than Haig and why? Um, I like Herbert Plumer. Um, I think he was, he was a brilliant field commander, you know, a man of great temperament, a man of great, a lot of people loved him. Um, he was a good he could he knew what you could or couldn't do on the battlefield and was very steady in, in terms of his temperament so i think i think plumer would have been an ideal choice um you know i think you know david lloyd george talked about you know curry and monash as a sort of dream team in 1918 i think uh, curry is a great commander monash is great they're obviously not tested above above the level that they're at so it's difficult to make that i think I think you, you look at their reputations and you think they would be good. Mm. Um, I think Curry could probably handle it. I don't have any problem. I think he was the kind of person that if he was to achieve that level, he would be fine at it. I wouldn't have any major worries for Curry if, if he was to be promoted into that position. Um, ultimately, you never know. It's, you know, who, if you're going to get the job at Manchester United after Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, you might have a good CV, but can you, um, can you actually cope? So uh, these are counterfactual questions that are always very difficult. But I think some of the senior, you know, British commanders, I think would have done pretty well as, as commander in chief. I think Plumer would have done a good job. I think Rawlinson probably would have done a good one as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Curry would have probably been fine. I know probably less about Monash really in terms of my own research, but I don't, I wouldn't have any worries about Curry in that sense. Um, mm. What circumstances would have enabled such an appointment? Um, well, I think you could look at the various situations, the, the counterattack at Cambrai where Haig's reputation is very poor and he's, you know, is he going to go with a march retreat? There are a number of areas where, a number of periods where uh, the, the government, in, you know, could have looked to make a change. Um, so there it would really be 1917, 18. I think most commanders, unless they really, really screw up, uh, you get a year or so, you get a good, I guess the... the um, you know, Haig, Haig and 1st of July 1916 is really the, the alternative. But I don't think, given that he was only placed in charge in December of the previous year, they were, were looking to make a change really then anyway. So do you think, I mean, should French have stayed on? Was it was and was Haig the best possible replacement at that time? Do you think? Um, no, I, I mean, I think I think French has to go. I think he's he's not up for it. He can't carry on. He's basically got a nervous breakdown. So I think he's you know he he's got to go. I think on paper Haig looks you know the obvious candidate really. Uh, I, I think the the decision to put Haig in charge is a pretty logical one. He seems much more able, much more willing, much more energetic, mm. much more um, like he's got his stuff together and he wants to do it and he's willing to do it. Mm. Um, well regarded. So I think the appointment of Haig isn't really a surprise to anyone. I think the the, the question, and, and I guess even if you could if you could forgive the the problems of 1916, I think 1917 is where Haig's judgment really goes a little bit a little bit crazy. But um, I think we'll come back to that in a minute. But but let's sort of go back to some of the broader themes uh, for a minute, perhaps if we might, and and particularly. You know, one of the themes that comes through very strongly in the book and, and already from what you've been talking about is is the, the need for armies fighting this kind of war to change, to adapt uh, and to carry on adapting and, and maintain a very high pace of adaptation throughout. And uh, I suppose I was wondering, you know, having now looked at, at all three, four if we count the Americans, five if we count the Belgians, uh, 
armies uh, over the course of the four years. You know, which one do you think manages that job most efficiently or effectively? And 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 I suppose what enabled them to do so as well. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great question. And, you know, my, my initial response would be, you know, I think the French do pretty well if you look at, you know, what they do. But then again, you know, you look at the British and the British start from a very diff different place. At least the French start with a big army with a lot of people who have mm. some experience, whereas the British just don't. So the British start with a small army that gets mostly wiped out in 1914. So and you, you consider the pace of change, the fact that the British were able to deploy tanks in September 1916 and you know develop fantastic aircraft by spring of 1917 and develop the you know things like flash botting and sound ranging and all that kind of thing and you know so I, you know I, I think in terms of the, the development of the British from from a standing start in 1914 to a mass army in 1916 and by the following by 1917 they've got a pretty good mass army that that's that's capable of really hurting the Germans so I think I think the British come out pretty well, really. I think if any comparison, I think the British come out well. I think it's very difficult to judge the Americans. The Americans do OK. Um, but again, I think they just don't have enough time. And I was criticized when one of my American friends, he said, there's not enough Americans in there. Um, and I said, well, this is a problem when you have chapters that are about two or three months long. Mm -hmm. You know, Americans can be in two chapters. That's it. You know, from Second Mon, July 1918 to the Hundred Days, two, three chapters. So, you know, I'm, and I would never un under, underplay the role and the importance of the Americans. But in terms of the on the battlefield, it's it's so late in the day. I think, you know, had the war gone on to 1918, I think you would have seen, you know, an American army that would have been very different and and you know clearly the most powerful of the Allied army. You know the, the Western Allies armies, um, so yeah, I think the Americans the Americans do pretty well for, with what they have and the speed that they have to build everything up. Um, but I think overall, I think the British, in terms of the, the technology and the stuff the British are doing in 1918, is way ahead of everyone else in terms of you know coordination between um, you know air power and tanks and that kind of thing they're playing with. I think that's pretty impressive. But that's notwithstanding that the French do lots of good stuff as well. And certainly they make they they push the pace in the early early part of the war. But I said the the French sort of I guess they sort of culminate by the end of 17, really, in terms of their development, really. They do some great stuff with those limited attacks where you know they can they can absolutely smash the Germans and 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 that's sort of where they culminate, I think, really. And I think then if you're looking at the big developments in combined arms i think it's it's british led that would be my impression i think terrific thank you well let's let's maybe move on and talk about some of the specific campaigns and and you know 1914 is always the um well place to start so i suppose my question would be do you think the schlieffen plan could ever have worked uh or was germany always going to lose something like the battle of the marne <sighs> I think it could have worked. It could have worked. Um, but I think it, it's all, it's the, the problem is that you, can you really have a plan that doesn't really include what the enemy does? You know, it's a plan that is in this design so that you can, the enemy cannot respond. Um, you know, and you've got all these what ifs that, you know, people have explored over the years. What if they'd have continued the march and, what if they'd done this or what if they'd moved this army? I think it's difficult. I think Germans can win in 1914. They can do it. But I think it's difficult. It's difficult for all the reasons that people have said, just the exhaustion, the fact they're going so far. But I think they can win. Um, and I've, I've got a soft spot for General von Kluck and, you know, that kind of, continue, you know, not wanting to pull back because he's, mm. he's ordered to pull back. If you can keep the pressure on the, on the French, there's just a hope that you can just... You can keep them going on the run, um, not not do it. So um, I think it can be done. But again, these are counterfactual questions, very, very difficult. But I think I think the French are, are strong enough in 1914 that in most scenarios, if they can get there, if they can redeploy quickly enough, they can probably do it. 
But I also think if the Germans take Paris, I think that does change things quite dramatic. So if they actually said, actually, no, instead of bypassing Paris, we're going to go into Paris. Mm -hmm. And I think if they can take Paris, I think that changes things quite significantly. You think the French would have collapsed? I think if they lose Paris, they can't continue the war because all of the arms factories in and around Paris. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, again, it would maybe the Germans couldn't have taken Paris, given the forces that they had there that, you know, to actually go through Paris, get through the defences would have mm. been problematic. But I think if the Germans can take Paris, not only do they have that crowning moment of victory marching down, you know, um, the Champs-Élysées, but it's it's that sense of without those factories, the, the French can't continue, you know, in any in any kind of even if the armies are intact, I think they they're in such a terrible situation. So um, mm, mm. I get, I, that's the sense that I get. I, I, I think it was a mistake not to go, not to go into Paris, not to actually try and try and take it rather mm. than actually know we're going to try and defeat the army in the field. So do you think, do you think Germany's already lost the war by the end of 1914? Or rather, rather is it, no. is it no longer, can they no longer win in 1914? No, they can. They oh. can win. They can win. I think it sounds like playing a war game, really. I think, but I think they can win the war, say a 65 percent victory or 70 percent victory, because they can win in the east. I see. And they and they can take and this this option to win in the east is available until 1918, um, but it's only the kind of greed, I suppose, of of the of the German high commander doesn't realize that. I think. There needed to be, after 94, needed to be a very clear assessment that they, it would be very difficult to defeat the French and the British together because they're just too powerful, they're too strong. Mm. Um, you know, the French are a major power. The British are probably, the, the, you know, the str- one of the strongest powers in the world. So the, the, the Germans had to recognise that defeating both of those powers was, was beyond it or would be very, very costly. And so they needed, I think there needed to be a, you know, a complete overhaul of political strategy, decision making and say, we can't beat these guys. They're just too strong. They're, 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 they're too committed to the fight. They've taken too many losses. Um, and again, if the, if the Germans can, you know, can redeploy to the east and can, and can defeat Russia, then uh, that they do. But I think, you know, the decision later on in the war is, is to, to go on to the offensive in 1918 is just crazy, really. Well, let's let's leave that let's leave that for a minute. But obviously, in 1915, Falkenhayn does kind of do what you're saying, right? He goes on the more or less on the defensive on on the Western Front, while while he concentrates on on the Eastern Front. Again, one of the things that struck me in your book was, you know, when you talk about the French offensives in the course of 1915, is that actually they've they've kind of worked out how to solve the tactical problem of the Western Front pretty well already in 1915. They've they can get across no man's land. And they can get into the enemy trenches and they can take the enemy trenches and, 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 and cause pretty significant problems to the Germans. Where they seem to have trouble is in exploiting those tactical successes. Why, why do you think it's, it's hard for them to do so? Well, I think it's, it's, a, it, it's an immature weapon system in a way that they, they can't coordinate as much as they need to. And their artillery is good and it can destroy things, but they can't destroy everything. So they can destroy the front zone quite well. And they can, they've got aggressive infantry. They can work out, they can do infiltration tactics. <laughs> but of course, then they just, just run out of steam. And, and that's the problem. I think they, and, and then by the end of 1915, I think most, uh, well, not most, sorry, but I think there's a, there's a sizable contingent that says we can't, there's only so far that an infantryman can go before mm. they run out of steam. And I think you you can you can't go much further in that in that trench environment we have in 1915. There's, there's no way you can go further, so you have to work with that. Mm. Um, but I think you know the reasons they struggle. I think is the fact that you just can't you you can't move up enough combat power to get through them. Mm. You know you can make the breach, but actually then working out when you've made the breach, where when the trench dead, deadlock is broken, communications are you know are not mm. possible. So we, even if you can open a, a way through, moving moving enough stuff through that shelled zone when you're being, you know, enfiladed, it is very very difficult. So you don't have any kind of the communications are a problem, the maneuver is a problem, 
Uh, and the, just, the, just the fact that every attack you do, the German defences just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper and stronger. Mm. So, mm. Uh, and that, um, that constant, you know, by, you know, they can break through in May 1915, but by the time they try it again in September, the Germans have had another defensive position. So, mm. so I think that's, that's the problem. The problem is that whenever they do make a good, they do a good thing, the Germans respond. Mm. And obviously the German response at a strategic level in 1916 is the Battle of Verdun. Um, to come back to the Western Front and to have another go, if you like, at, uh, at breaking the will of the, of the French army anyway. Um, what do you think Falkenhayn was really trying to achieve at Verdun? Did, did you ever think, and, and could it ever have worked? I know we're doing, by the way, if any of my students are watching, I know I always tell you that counterfactuals are the spawn of Satan and should not be discussed, but that, but that it's okay to talk about them in the pub. And morally, we're in the pub now. It's seven o'clock. So after seven o'clock. So, <clears throat> so that's why we're doing counterfactuals. Sorry, carry on. I don't know. It's just, I mean, it's a strange, it's a strange battle they're done, and I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I think about it. Really, I think it's, it's, it's lo in a, it's logical in the sense because Falcon Man always believes that the decision will be on the Western Front. Mm. So once he's essentially destroyed or really seriously degraded the Russian army. They've solved the Balkan problem, so they conquered Serbia. Um, so they've got a route through to the Ottoman Empire. So they sort of consolidated that sort of Central European, you know, space. Um, there's a question, well, have we achieved all that we want to achieve in the East? Essentially, the Russians have, you know, we've got most, of, pretty much all of Poland. We're into, so therefore we, we need to just, but Falkenhayn's reasonings for, for Verdun are all over the place. So you know, the memorandum he writes to the Kaiser is he identifies the British as the most significant enemy they face. Therefore, we need to fight the French mm. because the French are the sword of the English. It, it, it's well, why don't you strike the English? Because you might actually beat the English because in 1916, they're not very good. So if you have a massive attack on the northern sector of the Western Front, you might actually destroy the British because mm. they're not very good in 1916, whereas the French are pretty good. They've got good artillery. Their infantry is experienced. They've got good commanders. So, you know, the whole reasoning just seems bizarre to me. I mean, I think, you know, the idea of fighting attritionally, I think, is fair enough. But he never seems to think that he can do you know, There never seems to be an assessment of can you actually inflict this amount of loss on the enemy? Mm. You know, can, can you do this? Um, and when would you need to stop? And, and what at what point would they do it? Um, so you know, I, I just think the reasonings for Verdun are quite quite confused. And even by as soon as early as April 1916, Falkenheim's thinking, well, this is not working. So, but I can't really let it go because. So I, I can you shed any light on it? I don't know. I just I just find the reasonings quite strange, really. At least with the with the French, you can see what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, whereas. Falkenheim just, and it's from that point, from the, the moment they attack Verdun, the central powers start losing. Until the, until the attack on Verdun, the central, power, the central powers basic, have basically won. Yeah. They have won. And, you know, the, the, the Konrad von Hotzendorf argument is you should have attacked Italy in 16. Mm. The central powers should have done a joint attack on Italy to destroy Italy, which they could have achieved. And then basically, you know, the, the, the Austria-Hungary is completely, ice, you know, completely cocooned and safe there. Um, you know, you've got the, the Italians would be out of the war would cause chaos. Um, and then you can have some kind of political concessions in the West or at least some kind of pre go back to 1914 border. So the, the argument, which I'm actually exploring at the moment in my writing, is whether the attack on Italy in 16 would have been better. But Verdun is a strange one. I think on mm. some level it makes sense, on others it just seems very odd. I think part of the problem is, you know, and I think this is something that comes through very nicely in your book, is that a lot of the explanations that we get in the records are ex post, right? There's a lot of ex post justification of things that, you know, didn't go as well as anyone had kind of hoped uh, on day one or just before day one. Uh, so battles of attrition get get bigged up as it were because they failed to achieve the breakthrough the obvious an obvious case in point of course being the battle of the Somme we couldn't talk about the western front without talking about the battle of the Somme um <clears throat> do you think that was a bloody victory as um, one book about the battle of the Somme calls it for the British and the French 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from, my, from looking at it from a British perspective, I think it's hard to suggest it's a victory because the damage that the battle does. But having said that, you look at the German perspective and it's very clear that this is, a, this is an extremely vicious, brutal fight and they never want another one again. The casualties yeah. on the Somme are terrible. So I think from that perspective, you, it, it, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a victory, but it's, it's something that the Germans cannot go through again. And I think that the, le- the level of, of, you know, by September 16, they're really struggling. They're really, they're really not, they're not liking this at all. The, the Allies have total control of the air. The, you know, the dominance of the artillery is becoming much more, uh, the fact their army is getting smashed to pieces. So I think, you know, I think you, you've got to ha- have that, sort of both of the perspectives really um i think you can you can labor on british failures and and british mistakes which you know i i certainly would would you know would reflect but you look at the german perspective and it's this is not good i'm gonna i want to start move on to some of the other questions that are coming in because we're getting some great ones through and, and here's a good one which allows us to think about 1917 and 1918 kind of all in one go so why was the BEF a lot better in the 100 days than in 1917, despite the losses suffered in March and April 1918, do you think? Um, well, I'm not necessarily sure it was a lot better. I think the, the British do some good things in 1917 and they've got that, you know, the, the artillery and the air power and the tanks, everything works together quite well. Um, uh, you know, and I think that if you were looking at that sort of high point of the British on the Western Front in terms of the capabilities of their army, it probably would be 17. I think most of the commanders would probably say it peaks in 1917, I think June 1917, um, in terms of its numerical strength. So it, it seems to it seems to be the, the best it is in 1917. I think when you look at the successes of the 100 days, I think it's, it's a totally different situation. The, the, the Germans are out of their defensive positions and you know, the war is more mobile in that sense. And the Germans are, you know, have been terribly damaged. But also the, the British, you know, to give credit to the British, it's, it's, a, it's a different army as well. It's, you know, it's, it's a younger army. It's a less experienced army. So I think in 1918, I think the weapon systems are much more mature and, and everyone, you, you know, they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just working within a well-oiled system where they can replace things that get lost very easily. And uh, they've got whatever, whatever, um, shells they want or, or so they have that very very clearly in 1918 so i think that's probably one of the factors but 1918 they can have whatever they want when they attack so if you want a million shells you can have a million shells you want two million you can have that so i think that's a combination of it but i suspect 1917 the british army is, is you know you could argue that it's it's, it's peak then well let's let's think a little bit more about that so you, so you, so what you're saying essentially is that somewhere like messine is the sort of is the high point is it or the or the 31st of july 1917 perhaps um no i'd probably say you know um it's probably you know menin road or 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 Mm -hmm. polygon wood or you know when you i think you have those battles in in um sort of you know september early october 1917 i think that's probably i mean the scenes is impressive because you have the mines and everything but um but i think the the other battles are more impressive because they're done much on a much on a quicker basis they can do it yeah. and the fact that they can they can string together offensives you know they can attack a few days attack a few days attack and that operational tempo is really important and that's impressive from any perspective just to, to mount three massive battles in about 14 days is is quite impressive so i would suggest that's probably the high point um in terms of the, a certain type of warfare that they're beginning to evolve and i think from that point onwards you do see a shift in the in the end of 1917 where things that the pace of change quickens it's like they go up and eat another gear and everyone gets it at the same time the french and the germans they go up another gear which is really interesting mm. it's i mean it's a it's a dynamic isn't it it's not a it's not a sort of stable it's not a seesaw it's it's i'm trying to think of a good example it's almost like a it, it, it's like three fantastic hundred meter runners going through the heats and then the finals at the olympics against each other as they as they compete more and more directly against each other they all get better and better and better there isn't a there isn't a usain bolt <laughs> who stands out right from well the it's, it's like you know um the great tennis champions of the modern age yeah where they they they, they get it you know um they get better when they play each other then that's that's 
I guess that's a dynamic of warfare where the, the, the odds are so high, but you do see that in 17 where it, it seems to pace quickens, I think. Um, and I try to I try to discuss that. I mean, how close do you think Brit Haig comes to breaking the British army at Third Ypres, though? That's the that's always the criticism, right? That he, 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 yeah, that he yeah, gets and it wrong and he nearly and he nearly ruins the whole thing. Well, you know, if you look at the morale, I mean, Alexander Watson's done research on this on sort of morale mm. and and the you know the 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 period there's periods of poor morale in the British army. It's sort of 1914 in the retreat and and that, and then it's sort of August 1917. So that they are low periods because the weather's so bad. Um, so I think Haig takes an enormous risk in 1917 by doing that battle. There's no question about that. And, and you know, I think that that debate about whether he should have launched the attack is, is you know, will go on. I think the, the, the shame is that there's no, the French and the British are not coordinating things at this time. They needed to be, by 1917, at a coordinated headquarters where you can, you can devise strategy. Because on the one hand, you have Pétain who says, wait for the tanks and the Americans and you have Haig says we can win the war in 1917 so one goes and the other stays and it mm. so you know this lack of of co command coordination I think is a real danger and all all the army suffer from it you know the the Austrians and the Germans don't get on and they don't really it's only later in the war that the Germans basically completely take over but they they want to do their own thing so that lack of fully joint command I think is a big issue and it, the Allies get there fair play they get there in 1918 but um, that, that strikes me as being a significant error the fact that there had to be particularly when the French go so low in 1917 and the French are in such serious trouble but even if even if the British don't know about that they get a sense that something's not right but the, the decision had to be clear when the Russians go out and the Americans come in they needed to be Paris and London get together and say right we have to have a strategy to win the war. And now we have the Americans. So the strategy has to include that. Whereas the Haig's view is, well, we're just going to win the war anyway. Mm, mm, mm. And, and Petan takes the correct decision, which is we have to, we have to safeguard the army and shepherd the Americans in and hold the line until the Americans can win, which is in my view, the correct strategic decision to make. And to Haig to sort of go his own way in 1917 for me, I think it's a is a major failure of command. But you know, mm -hmm. that's that's my perspective. I just don't buy the I buy the apologists for that one, unfortunately. I mean, why do you think it takes them nearly four years to to work this out? This seems like a to us looking at it from a post World War II perspective, it looks like a no brainer, right? So, so why well, can't they you know the French the 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 British and the French are, are kind of, you know, love and hate, isn't it? It's love and hate, you know, to be subordinate to the French is like the worst thing ever to that generation of British army officers. It's, it's, it's not acceptable, but there's no mechanisms to do it. So Robertson, chief of the general, chief of the Imperial general staff says, well, you know, we have the, you know, this is how the, we can't sub subordinate it. You know, the authority comes from the King. So you can't subordinate this to a foreign power. It's, it, we just don't have a mechanism to do it. Mm, mm. Uh, and he's correct. So you can't, you know, you can't do that. So I think it's, it's indicative of, of the, the how the war changes things and how the war reveals the limitations of the ex existing status quo. Mm. Um, and the fact that you can't just put your army under a foreign general that easily, but um, you know, that, but of course, nobody thinks the war's going to go on this long. Nobody thinks they're going to need it and all these kind of factors. So the Allies get there in 1918 because they have to. Um, and maybe that was the only way that it was it was always going to happen that way. I don't know. I mean, it always strikes me for what it's worth that we underestimate how novel this kind of war was. You know, to be fighting a mass industrial war in mass democracies this was the first time anyone had ever done it and so it's hardly surprising that there were frictions between the generals and the politicians you know that they, they had to uh, they had to make up a model of civil military relations as they were going along uh, essentially um, it's not you know not easy thing to do uh, um now we're getting some other questions here uh, 
which I quite like the look of. I mean, they're all very good. Some of them we've already sort of covered a little bit. But here's one which I think will... Um, uh, well, let me start with this one first of all. Sharon says, where did you do most of your research and what research resources did you use when writing the book? Um, most, of the, most of the research is, is sort of published sources. There's, there is a sort of selection of unpublished material in, in there where necessary, but um, there's, there's huge amounts of published material out there in terms of which is what I, what I did. So you've got the French official history with mm. about 20 volumes and each volume is like a thousand pages of documents, which, you know, most people don't use. So, you know, for the French army, I used a lot of that material, um, and obviously you've got, you know, all the, I think about, again, about 15 volumes of the German official history. And obviously we've got the British official history. There's a lot of American documents that have been published. And obviously you have the memoirs of the individuals, you have their diaries, you have their um, correspondence has been published. You have their um, cabinet office records in, in, on, in the national archives um, that you can talk about the decisions that were made, the political, military, strategic decision-making. So mm -hmm. it's a whole range of, of material you, uh, you can use. The question is, is at, at what level, how far are you down and, and what range of stuff you can get? But there's, there's loads of stuff out there that, you know, again, most people don't use. So I, I tried, to, tried to bring as much new stuff as I could, or at least stuff that hadn't been you sort of extensively quoted, really. Um. Which I think leads us into a question here from Kate. Now, she's, she's asking specifically about, oh, what a lovely war and, and the film and, and, and uh, piquing her interest in the war. But I suppose, you know, one of the things I liked about your book was the fact that you managed to, you managed to bring in individual testimony, but without losing sight of the bigger picture. I mean, so how important was it to you to tell the story of what happened, as it were, rather than what it was like to be, you know, uh, one of the poor bloody infantry in the trench. Well, I think you know, I think we've done we've done that. You know, there's there's plenty of books out there. I think you you're sort of trying to actually keep a you know a hold on it and a control of it. I think was was what I tried to do. So I say quite high in terms of you know looking you. Because I wanted to essentially follow individuals. It's their characters, really, the story that they go through the book. And there's key individuals that rise and fall and sometimes rise very quickly and then burn out or sometimes yes. get fired and come back. So I find that really interesting because if you write a, like an individual battle study or a campaign history or you don't get that from previous histories, you only get it when you do the whole thing and you can see these people come in and out and they get promoted or they get moved on. So that was really one of the mechanisms to sort of maintain control really of the narrative because mm -hmm. you need to have some assessment of what's going on but I wanted to keep it very much with with the generals and their sort of higher level operational sort of assessment of what is going on so it was a choice not to not to get too bogged down into the individual testimonies because I think that's been done I mean there's so many fantastic you know historians who've, who've who've mined the testimonies of the individuals that I didn't really feel there was mm. essentially much, much point in that really. Understand. Thank you very much. Um, and I suppose following on from that, well, let me ask you one other question. First of all, what do you think will surprise readers of your book? Um, I, I guess it depends on what they know about the First World War. Um, but I think for a lot of people, if they, they, they might know a little bit or they don't know it, I think they'll probably be surprised when they get to them. I think they'll be surprised that actually it's a lot more interesting than maybe they give it credit for. And the, 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 the kind of getting out of the trench and walking slowly towards the enemy and getting shot down is, is, is just a sort of um, a gross oversimplification of what is going on. So I think if people read it, they might be surprised. Oh my God, there actually is a lot of thought going on here. And yes, you get incompetent commanders and they do sometimes do stupid things, but overall there's a huge challenge that, that is faced that is un, sort of un, unlike anything they'd ever experienced. So I think most, most people will be surprised. They will go through it and think, and I want them to think as they're going through it, well, what would have I, you know, what would I have done? Would I have done any better? And I think that will be a big thing that'll surprise them, particularly the French and the developments they make early on. And I think you can understand the way it develops the way it does. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that will be surprising to people where they'll actually 
um, they'll actually see how it develops and see all the challenges and that kind of thing. So, so I think the French army, I think would be a key one. People would maybe see their role in a little bit of a better light. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably be a main thing I think people might find. Great, good. Now, uh, this question from Kevin, I think is an interesting one because it'll lead us into a discussion that I suspect you'll be keen to have. From a, methodolo from a methodological perspective, what are the benefits of thinking about the First World War in terms of individual fronts as opposed to individual battles or campaigns or the entire war uh, itself? Obviously, you have chosen to do to write this book about the Western Front. I believe there are two more volumes on the way. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what you're going to be covering in them and then maybe come to Kevin's question about why you've chosen, it, ch chosen to do it that way. Um, well, I think one of the reasons I, I, I thought about doing it for fronts, because it, I think if you write in, in, like say you could say, I could have said, right, I want to do a history of the whole war. And I think, and I, I wanted to do it in a narrative sense. So I wanted to sort of have that flow of time and and move through. And I, I think if you, if you do, for example, a history of the First World War in a narrative sense in that way, you're constantly shifting between fronts. One minute you're in France, then you're at Tannenberg in East Prussia, then you're in Galicia, then you move back to France, and then you move back to East Prussia, and then you move on to the high seas, and then you move. So you're constantly switching, and you're switching to different generals, and it's too disorientating for the reader. Um, so in terms of the narrative that I wanted, it has to be concentrated in a place. And the individuals involved, you see them, and it's their war. You know, the war that Foch fought was the Western Front. Foch doesn't fight the Italian Front. He doesn't fight Austria. He doesn't fight in the Middle East. Okay, those things happen, and they affect what he does, or, and he's aware of them. His war is there, and most of the generals, of the, you know, that we're talking about, that is there. It's on a front. So... You know, the more I thought about it, the more I think it's just it's just a way of doing it. And again, when we're talking about the, the, the second, uh, you know, the next two volumes, um, you know, you're going to have, you know, a totally different picture and that you will refer obliquely to the Western Front. So it'll be totally different. It's a totally different war. Um, so I think it, it just fits with what I wanted to do and it fits with the narrative. But I think if even if I had a lot more words, I just think the constant moving back and forth that you'd have to do would be too taxing on the reader and too confusing for, you know, for, for, for a lot of people. So I was grateful that, and you can get to know the characters and you can get to know the places much better when you stay here. And, mm -hmm. you know, I hope readers go through the trilogy and, and, you know, I can take them to lots of other places. We Galicia and Poland and Italy, and, and then we'll go further afield to the Middle East. And so, uh, I think it's, it's, for me, it was just the way that it fitted. Um, but the more that I think about it, the more that I, I feel it's, it's, it's what I wanted to do, I feel was, was, was the right choice and I was happy with it. Can you tell us a little bit about Great what's in the volumes then? Please. Yeah, well, we got, you know, volume two I'm working on at the moment is the Eastern Front. So that's obviously the, the war against Russia, but it, it also includes the Balkans and Italy because that's, you know, that's obviously related to, to, to that. I mean, you know, if you look at Western Front, it's essentially France's war. Volume two will be Austria-Hungary's war, the, the campaign against Russia with the, obviously the Balkans where it starts. So it's a totally different story. Um, mm. I, I, it's, and it will, I think for people that, you know, again, are largely on, you know, almost totally unfamiliar with the Eastern Front, it will be a real revelation, I think, to them to see how that war is. Because that's really where the war starts, and that's where the war, um, in, in many cases, it, it's, it's, again, a totally different situ situation than the West. Um, and then the third volume, we'll, we'll go even further, uh, you know, afield. So we'll talk about the war in Africa and the Middle East. So it will focus on, you know, Turkey's war, Gallipoli, um, you know, Palestine, Mesopotamia, Germany, East Africa, you know, all those sort of far away places. So it will just geographically just move on. Uh, but all of the all of the volumes, you, you know, they're sort of individual volumes. You don't have to read all three. You can get the story if you're just interested in one. Um, but we'll we'll see how it goes. But I think it's it's just it's just a fascinating journey through the war in in a way that maybe hasn't been done before. Super. And I suppose, which I mean, you know, you've laid yourself open. I'm bound to ask it now. What about volume four on the home fronts? No, it's a trilogy. 
that's it. <laughs> it's a trilogy. But I mean, I, I suppose my slightly more sensible question is, what, so what you're saying is that this is a war that was decided on battlefields. This was, this was not a... This was not a war that was decided by economies and industries and scientists and, and so on. Is that, is that what you're saying by implication? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, those, those things are, are important, of course. You know, the, the industrial mobilization and yeah. the societal mobilization, I think, are crucial. They're not where I'm really interested in, though. I think that's the thing. It's, it's again, quite traditional in the sense that I, I'm just interested in the generals and how the battles feel and how command worked and... and those things are part of the story, um, but for me, it, it's not where my interest lies. And so, um, you know, I, I very much wanted to, I think I allude to those issues, but I'm not, they're not part of the story in that sense. It's about those key people, those key generals and politicians that, that try to fight the war. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. the focus of it. And I think that's, you know, that's really what I was interested in, what I think a new story can be told, but I wouldn't seek to undermine the, the role of industry or science and all that kind of thing in at, you know maintaining the war effort and, and providing weapon systems and all that kind of thing and then i think this is probably better be the last question but it's a good one so i think and it's a good one i think to finish on and it was asked actually ages ago by simon i hope he's still on can you nominate one area or aspect of the western front which is still understudied and still needs re-evaluation well, I mean, recent decades, we've had some fantastic work on the French army, um, you know, uh, by, you know, a range of historians, Elizabeth Greenhalge, um, Jonathan Krauss, Tim Gale, you know, some fantastic work on them, on the French. So there's elements of the French army. I'd love a new biography of General Nivelle. Well, yeah. I'd love a, a proper biography of him because I think he's a fascinating character. Um, I think there are, you know, there are aspects of, of the French army that we could learn more about. Um, I'd like to see something on the Belgians as well, mm -hmm. a proper study of the Belgian army in the First World War and, and their role, because I think it hasn't been talked about and maybe it, maybe it should. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you've also got, you know, things like the Austrians on the Western Front in 1918 and, and there's sort of all those elements of it, you know, Chinese laborers on the Western Front. So there are, there are elements of it that, that can be um, that can be discussed, but I think certainly from the British perspective, I think we're we're getting to a point where we are we're sort of gradually filling in the blanks. I think of of the BEF's evolution, and I think that needs to continue with the French Army certainly. Um, and I think the American Army has been pretty well studied. There's some fantastic stuff on the Americans, mm. and I think that all needs to be integrated really, um, obviously alongside you know all the other armies. But I think we're I think we're getting there, but obviously there's still there's still a lot of hard yards to do before you've, you know, before we've actually, you know, and again, I would like, there's so many generals that just do not have biographies. And again, that I think are important figures in their own right. So. I'm going to, actually, I'm going to ask one more, one more question. And, and that is, if we look back now at 200 years distance to the Napoleonic Wars, for instance, it's probably more or less fair to say that although every now and again people will reinterpret them a little bit, but broadly there's a consensus about, you know, more or less what happened and who was responsible for what and so on and so forth. Obviously, we're 100 years on, just over 100 years on from the end of the First World War, and it feels as if we're still quite a long way from reaching a consensus uh, about that war. You know, will our great grandchildren or great great grandchildren in a hundred years' time have reached some kind of consensus? Do you think, or are they still going to be arguing about the learning curve of the British Expeditionary Force? Um, I think I think it does. I mean, I think you need at least a hundred years to pass, and and then you can start talking about it, and you can talk about the American Civil War. You know, it's only really. Yeah. You know, in the last 30, 40 years, that we've we've really managed to take a lot of the heat out of it and, and begin to assess it um, in, a, in a more logical, consistent way. And I think you can see all the trends in, in, in the First World War his, historiography leading up to a situation where we can see it much more, you know, dispassionately, I suppose. So I think there was a question, I think, about, you know, oh, what a lovely war and whether it's, you know, do you do damage it did to serious analysis? But that's just the way it goes. We have these waves and you can't, you can't have an, a massive event like the First World War and then within 50 years have a fully 
developed mature historical assessment of it, it is always going to go through hundreds of years or at least a hundred years of, of working it through for the, you know, people to write their memoirs, to have all those arguments, then for the records to be released, it has to go through that process. So maybe now after a hundred, hundred and a bit years, we can begin to start to look at the first war in more of a dispassionate way. So I think, you know, all this research that we've done is, is got us to a place where we can begin to start to understand it in a way that is more satisfying than maybe we've had in, in previous generations.